morning. Thank you all very much. Um, with that introduction, I'm James Firth. I work for Fisher's Gin, and I uh, <coughs> am a forager and a botanist, and I have a couple of other strings to my bow while we're about it as well. Um, how do you use this thing? Ah, OK. There we are. Scruff's Gin. Um, <coughs> I've been very kindly presented with a, an introductory theme tune and a bottle of Scruff Gin, which I suppose you can all come up and have a sniff of later. I'm not quite sure what's in it, to be honest with you, but it's definitely gin. Um, there's my introductory slide. Apparently you can add anything to gin. Well, let's find out. Um, access and foraging rights is a start. I'm actually going to deal with the uncertain legality of foraging. And I'm going to talk about the framework exi that exists to help protect us from poisoning each other and our esteemed clients. And I'm going to illustrate this with a few examples from one family and a couple of <coughs> minor talking points about the use of botanicals and their, and their supplies wholesale. Okie doke. So, moving on. <coughs> I want to get a couple of things out there straight so that I don't get brought up on these later on. This is my take. I'm not a lawyer. There's several in the room. This is what I take to be the case. It may not be. You have to satisfy yourself. But as far as I can see, it is not possible. You cannot legally forage plants of any kind if they're cultivated without permission in the UK. It is just not legal. Secondly, absolutely nobody has a carte blanche to forage commercially in the UK. You need permission to forage commercially. Moving on, <clears throat> all land is owned by somebody, and whoever owns that land owns what grows on that land. Within this context, uh, we bring ourselves to the 1968 Theft Act, which defines our right to forage. <coughs> um, as you can see, whilst it's a... Up there. OK, whilst it's an offence to uproot plants without authorisation, a person who picks flowers, fruit and foliage from a plant growing wild on any land doesn't steal what he picks, unless he does it for a commercial purpose. This is the famous picking and plucking clause, which allowed people to forage for some decades. And unfortunately, the Countryside Rights of Way Act interfered with this. It gives people the right to roam on moor, mountain, heath, down and registered common land, but only providing we don't intentionally remove, damage or destroy any plant or part of a plant. So, essentially, it's all right to pick and pluck, but if you do so, you have no right to be on the land. Complicated. There's clearly an inconsistency, and <clears throat> the only thing I can say about that is right to roam doesn't actually apply to enclosed common land. Uh, sorry, enclosed private land. There, are, there will eventually be some kind of test case on this, but I'm not aware of one. If anyone is, please pipe up at this point. Um, that is the complicated context in which foraging, foraging exists at the moment. On top of this, an owner of land has various rights to control that access onto that land, and the public, of course, may have rights to access that land in turn. So we've got controls of access, which are essentially trespass and bylaws, and rights to access, which are enshrined in public, public footpaths, bridleways, and so forth, rights of common and right to roam. For control of access, all land in the UK is owned by somebody, and access across that land is subject to the law of trespass. In England and Wales, you need the owner's permission to go on land unless you have any other right of access. If you don't, you're trespassing. Trespassing is not a criminal offence, but it is a civil wrong, and the owner can sue you if you are involved. The police won't be interested, but the owner might. There's also control from bylaws, um, which are local council. They're, they're a strange kind of, of, of delegated legislation. They cover geographical areas, and they regulate the various activities uh, in the interest of safety, and uh, various activities in the interest of safety and security. It's a, an offence, a criminal offence, to breach these bylaws as well. If there is a bylaw in force, there should be signs displayed at access points and elsewhere. But, of course, as everyone knows with signs in the countryside, they may have had a plant grow over them, they may have been removed, they may have been defaced. They're quite popular as target practice. I'm sure you're all well aware of that. Um, <clears throat> so, perhaps best to check with the council first. Rights of access. 
We have common land. Common land is land that is owned by somebody, but others, known as commoners, have the right to go on that land and use it or take resources from it. These rights are rights of common, and they belong to defined groups of people, and the general public are not necessarily included inside that. However, there is right of access. There are various quaint anachronisms associated with rights of common, things like piscary, turbury, estevan, panage, and animals ferri naturae, which are quite amusing, um, but they don't necessarily apply to the general public. There's various other reasons why you can't forage. Uh, here they are. They're direct plant protections. Um, the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, Countryside Rights of Way Act, which we've seen a little bit of. Uh, the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, Schedule 8, repeated, got wrong, my apologies, what can we do? And the EU Habitats Directive and CITES and various other forms of legislation of one kind or another, which limit what you can do on the land and what you can take off it. Of these, you should be aware of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, especially Schedule 8. Schedule 8 has special protections. Essentially, for plants on Schedule 8, you can't do anything with it, leave it alone, unless you're authorised by the relevant authority, which is not the landowner, unless the landowner is, for example, Natural England. If I may paraphrase it, for those protections, if you pick, uproot, or destroy any wild plant included in Schedule 8, or any seed or spore attached to any such wild plant, then that's an offence. If you're not authorised and you uproot any wild plant not included in Schedule 8, that's also an offence. So this is actually reinforcing the Theft Act, um, and it's also providing an extra tier of protection for some plants which are now naturally scarce. Furthermore, <clears throat> there's, a further, there's a further part to this. If you sell or offer for sale any live or dead wild plant included in Schedule 8, or any part of or anything derived from such a plant, or publish or cause to be published an advertisement likely to be understood as conveying that you buy or sell or intend any of those things, that's an offence as well. So you're not allowed to put spring gentian in your gin, but you're not even allowed to claim you put spring gentian in your gin, because not only may you be prosecuted, but the person who makes the bottle may be prosecuted as well. We also have the EU Habitats Directive and CITES. EU Habitats covers European rare plants. CITES covers global trade in plants. In both cases, they're fairly large frameworks. CITES only applies to uh, native orchids in the UK. You can't deal with them. You can't trade in them in any shape or form. You can't even sell a botanical sample. Uh, EU Habitats Directive, all the UK natives are already included uh, in Schedule 8. So that's essentially the legal framework. There are also voluntary codes and registers that you are not obliged to follow, but you may wish to if you are an ethical forager. Red data lists, uh, one such uh, characteristic, one such uh, uh, code. BSBI rare plant registers, another one. The one in 20 rule, if anyone uh, is interested in that, I'll talk about it afterwards. It's a guideline for responsible collecting. It doesn't directly apply to foragers, but you should at least follow that as a bare minimum if you are foraging uh, to make sure that local populations don't get denuded and stripped out. There's one last little characteristic, uh, one last little um, curiosity, which is shoreline plants. Shoreline is owned, like everywhere else in the UK, someone owns it, um, and countryside rights of way doesn't apply to the shoreline. However, access is confused and uh, contentious, I should think is the best word for putting it, and no one is very sure what their access rights are to the shoreline. What I can tell you, if you're a forager, is that apparently, and again, this is internet knowledge, this bit, I'm afraid, um, there's a common right to collect seaweed from the seashore as long as it's been detached from the seabed. If it hasn't been detached, you can't collect it. Best to make your own inquiries. And one special word for commercial foraging. All wild plants are owned. Commercial gain from the land without the landowner's permission is theft. Scrumping might sound nice, but at law, it's the same sentence. So best get permission first. You have to find out who owns the land, and you have to obtain those permissions and make sure you have the right to take those, those plants. Ooh. 
Anyone? Well, there we are. Right, moving on, adding jam to gin. Is it a good idea? Well, does <clears throat> anyone, anyone here actually listen to the archers? <laughs> Go on, say if you are, because I can't find anyone who's listened to the archers about this. Did I? I saw, I think I saw. Yeah, there's one person here. We must be the biggest group of people who don't listen to the archers in the UK. Okay. <clears throat> oh my goodness, there we are. What can we put in our gin? Well, as we all know, flavourings have to be approved. But let me ask, here's another question to put out to the, the great and good here. Who approves them? Who approves these flavourings that we can add to gin? Does anyone know? I'm asking because I don't. Maybe. Do they have a name? Is it the union list? Ah, OK. Well, I couldn't find that. So, fantastic. Thank you very much. So we do actually have a, a, <clears throat> a body that might be approving the gin. Thank you. Um, I chased UK people. I chased trading standards, MHRA, FSA, DEFRA, and the only people who haven't so far responded are DEFRA, and they're the only people who so far haven't denied responsibility for this matter. But I haven't chased the EU, so there we go. <clears throat> Whatever goes in, however, is definitely going to be subject to the general food law regulations from 2002 and the Food Safety Act. So, bearing this in mind, how can a forager know what might be safe to put in gin? Is there a yardstick for what might be a good, safe botanical? It would be helpful, but unfortunately, helpful is about as far as it goes. The USA does have a code of federal regulations with a register of substances generally recognized as safe, and this blue book from the EU sounds like another source to be worth uh, approaching. Of course, the US register doesn't help with U EU legislation, but nonetheless, it's at least a good guidance. Does it have a safe history of use in spirits? Um, is it legally available for sale as a foodstuff in the EU? Does it have historical use as a foodstuff or a food additive without credible documented ill effects? Because everything has incredible documented ill effects because of the presence of quackery and uh, snake oil salesmen in the 18th, 17th, 16th, and earlier centuries. Pretty much everything is an abortifacient if you look far enough back. Uh, pretty much anything will cure scrofula as well if you go looking far enough into the documentation, but it doesn't seem to actually work that way. There's the union list of flavorings and source materials, but it does not, it has an exclusion on spices, herbs, and mixtures for infusions. I'm not sure that's going to help us. But if you find yourself on any of these lists, including this blue book, then yes, you might be safe as long as what you're going to use isn't going to be subject to any unusual storage or any unusual extraction or processing that hasn't been covered by its previous uses. So it's quite tricky, really. Essentially, it sits on your shoulders. An approved product, also on the union list, has to meet a technical grade. It could be that approval and being on a technical grade counts as some kind of approval for use of botanicals. I'm not sure. Is there a good yardstick for an unsafe botanical? Well, <clears throat> the EU union list has a list of substances which shan't be, shan't be added to food as such, but this is actually a list of, uh, of chemicals rather than a list of uh, ingredients. It's got things like hydrocyanic acid in it, which I'm sure none of you are in a rush to put in your gin. Uh, it also includes, lately, capsicin, uh, um, coumarin, and thuyon, which are slightly more of interest in this particular room. There's the European Medicines Agency website, which has a searchable monograph of of a herbal, um, herbal, searchable series of herbal monographs relating to um, medicinal use only. There's a UK banned and restricted herbal ingredients list. Again, this is referring to medicine use. Um, and inside there, there's a couple that might just get an eyebrow raising in here. There's uh, quinine. There's a uh, common squash. What's that all about? And there is pomegranate bark. Anyone know why common squash is on that list? Someone will. There's part of the human 
Medicines Regulation Act 2012, which expands on the previous, and the FDA in America does have a fantastic poisonous plant database, which I personally find myself nosing through quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> and we'll come back to that a little bit. I'll move on in the meantime. A few examples. I'm going to focus on one family, which is the APACE or cow parsley or carrot family. Most of you, I'm sure, are aware of, of that, aware of that. It's a large family. There's about 48 genera. No idea how many species in the UK. It's got some pretty important crops. It's got carrots, celery, cumin, dill, parsley, and, and, uh, and parsnips. It also, of course, includes angelica and coriander, which is why we are so interested in it. But there are many other interesting species belonging to this belong to this family, which I think have potential in gin. I mean, arguably, this family delivers as much of the signature of gin as juniper berry. That's for people to argue at, though. So here we are. There's an example. <coughs> it's easy to spot the family resemblance of umbellifers, which they used to be known as. They've got these herbaceous, herbaceous they've got flattish or, or domed flowers, which are usually held up above the, the foliage fairly well. Um, this is an umbellifer here. Uh, this one we're going to come back to later. Um, they've got feathery leaves, and they have characteristically aromatic uh, parts. Not all of them, but almost all of them. Unfortunately, our job is not to know what's an umbellifer, to know what the difference is between them. So rather like Belitis mushrooms, this, spe this uh, family contains some of the most esculent and some of the most poisonous plants. We have to be slightly careful. Identification isn't easy, and it's certainly not for the beginner. They show one of the reasons for this is that umbellifers tend to show high variability in the field. They don't start the season the way they end the season. They can change their leaf shape. They can change their leaf divisions. Um, they also have phenotypic uh, variation, and vegetative features are quite often not enough for a secure identification. So you need seeds or flowers, which is fine. But if you're foraging and it ain't got seeds and flowers, what exactly are you going to do about that? So it's quite tricky. I'd say, can anyone recognize this? But you should be able to. It's written on the bottom. Um, Alexander's. Who uses that in their gin, or who's trialing it in their gin? Nobody? I am quite surprised. Um, background, Roman introduced plant. It's uh, now gone naturalized around the UK. Uh, it, was very popular until about the 15th century when it got displaced by celery. All parts are edible. Um, all parts are pretty delicious as well. The seeds are particularly a uh, good source of, uh, of, um, bota of, uh, of, of, um, of botanicals. And I would I'd recommend you to pay attention to it, especially as it's quite easy to find. It's very easy to grow. Leaves are often simple and threes, shiny. You can just about see that they've got very slightly serrated edges. Um, it's a pretty little thing, and it flowers very early, and that's essentially its biggest ident. If you see, it, if you see something flowering in May, it's, uh, and it's big and it's by the coast, it's probably going to be Alexander's. Anyone know what that is? Go on, have a guess. It's not a trick. No. It's Angelica. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> introduced at some point in history, pre-16th century. I wouldn't like to say how early before the 16th century. It's almost exclusively a cultivated plant. It's, um, I'm afraid this isn't the best picture ever. Um, but one of the idents that you can get on it first, it's huge. But you'll also see, if you look, the petioles have very swollen bases. I can't actually see one. I did see it yesterday. The petiole, if you've, got a, if you've got the stem of a plant and you've got the leaf coming off, then the leaf stalk is the petiole. And the base of the leaf stalk on, on Angelica tends to get very heavily swollen, quite bulbous around the base. And it also wraps around the stem. It's, a re it's not a secure identification feature, but it's pretty much. If you're, if you add to that the fact that it almost never escapes the garden, you're pretty safe. It's a cultivated plant. Um, it flowers much later than Alexander's, with, it, with which it otherwise shares sim similar size. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about it. We all know about, about its, uh, its uses. Anyone? 
No, this is the trouble. On Belifers, they all kind of look vaguely similar. Um, they don't always grow in the same places and so forth, but this is water, uh, hemlock water drop wort. Um, does that ring any bells to anyone? It is probably the most poisonous plant in the UK. So we don't want to be picking that. It's very widely distributed. It's mostly um, on the western side, but it's all over the UK. If it's got hemlock in the name, it doesn't go in gin. In fact, it doesn't go in humans at all. It's just poisonous. Um, there are plenty of history, uh, historical accounts of its use, especially in Neuragic Sardinia. It is believed to be the... Uh, to be the plant behind the sardonic grin, um, which was not a very pleasant experience for those who found themselves with it. It does cause fairly rapid death. What's that? Is this one safe, anyone? It's wild angelica, angelica sylvestris. Huge PTLs, I believe, are slightly easier to see on this. It's not very good. You can just see there, that huge PTL base. If you look around, you'll see there. They're not as, they're not as defined as they are on Garden Angelica. Um, it's not the same as the Garden variety. It looks kind of vaguely similar, and I actually don't know if it's worth trialling. I it, believe it might have more coumarins than Angelica, so maybe not so good. But apparently, it's not difficult to find. If you find it, the leaves are very good stewed with rhubarb. So there you go. A couple of things to watch out for if you are dealing with, um, <coughs> if you're dealing with commercial supply of angelica. Angelica root is often sold, and it's not always garden angelica. It's quite often various Asian species, which are you know, produced for their, for, for their own markets and just drift through into the wholesale market. One has to be slightly careful. They're not... They're not poisonous or anything, but they don't, they, they, they don't have the same display of, 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 of active ingredients. Angelica seed, if you're using that, is again often Golpa, which is a completely different genus from Iran, or rather inexplicably the Czech Republic. And there are various other issues with Angelica confusions as well. So one needs to be slightly careful with Angelica on the wholesale market. Most things look rather the same. Most seeds look rather the same. You need to have a good look through. This one? No worries, it's the last one. This one's another hemlock, so we know what we're gonna go, where we're going to go with that. It's also called cowbane, children's bane, beaver poison, snakeweed. You get the general drift. It's extremely poisonous, and just like water, uh, <coughs> northern, uh, just like hemlock water dropwort, it produces roots. Hemlock water dropwort produce roots which look rather like a dahlia, really. Um, this produces roots which look rather like a parsnip, and this does cause a fair few poisonings around the UK over the years. Um, but if you actually go and pick this up yourself, you'll discover the roots are actually spongy and hollow, so you'd be a pretty odd person to want to eat a parsnip like that. Moving on, here's a couple of grassland umbellifers. Um, these are ones that I have to identify um, because Fishers uses, as one of its signature botanicals, spignol. This is spignol, which I brought in. Um, it's, it looks relatively easy to identify, but once it's growing out in the field, it's very difficult to identify. It's in the grass. The leaves often die off. It grows in the same locations, broadly speaking, as walled caraway. This is walled caraway. You can see there the leaves here. They're not very good, and this is one of the problems you have. It's very difficult to find leaves sometimes inside the grass, and it gets quite tricky. So what you require for this, if you wish to identify it clearly, is you need seed or you need the flowers. Now, I did actually have some nice flower heads on this, but unfortunately it fell off in the tube. So <clears throat> there's another problem. The, the petals don't stay on that long. So sorry about that, guys. That's, the, uh, that's, that's this. That's, oops, excuse me. That is um, <coughs> spignol. And that is the, um, that, those are the botanical drawings of them. Obviously, these are designed to uh, highlight the differences. You can see that spignol on the left has a much more ramified leaf, much more divided leaf. Um, and the seeds are fractionally different. They're long, they're more elongated. They've got different ridges in them. And they have smaller little hairs at the top end. That's fine. But rather like the petals on this, the seeds have happened to falling straight off. So it can be tricky when the leaves have gone, once the slugs have got them. Luckily, Miam is delicious. You're welcome to come up and have a go in the coffee 
area, come and have a, uh, a pluck of this and see if you like its presentation. Um, I think it goes very well in our gin, but then I would, wouldn't I? Move over from that one. <clears throat> I'm going to move on and talk now about problems with commercial harvesting. Common juniper. Everyone knows common juniper. Um, <clears throat> What is the commercial? What, what is the, the foragers ident for, commercial, for, for common juniper? How do you know if it's a common juniper plant? Has nobody stuck their hand in a common juniper bush? It's, it's very prickly. You stick your hand in that, and it's like sticking your hand in a bag full of cats. It, you know about it. On the right-hand side, we have Juniperus sabina. Um, come back to that one in a minute. Um, there are about 60 species of, of juniper worldwide, and one of them at least is on the FDA poisonous plant database, and inevitably it is Sabina on the right. Now, Sabina berries look quite similar to juniper, to common juniper berries. I picked these in Suffolk in April this year, these three. These are all three different species of juniper berries. And I would like to know if anyone can spot which is which. The problem we have here is not, it's not a sort of a kind of a quiz here, but um, Sabina and communists, um, so that's common and Savin juniper, have overlapping, have overlapping distributions in parts of Europe. If you are a field, a field worker and you have a, you're sent out piece rates always to go and collect juniper berries, and you have the opportunity of sticking your hand in a, in a bush that's covered in prickles and collecting berries that look like this. Or there's something which is lower down but has a nice soft texture to it, and you can collect berries that look like this. There is a motivation, if you don't know that one is poisonous, to mix the two together. And I do wonder if some of the, uh, the evident um, uh, uh, variation that people account for with juniper might come from the fact that there is a mixing of these two species in the, in the supply chain. But we have another problem as well with juniper, which is in the UK especially, there's an awful lot of juniper plants. People love them in gardens. Gardeners adore them, and there are endless numbers of hybrids, and these hybrids are picked because they're beautiful, uh, but unfortunately they're not picked because anyone knows their parentage. So unfortunately, these things are out there, and we don't know if these are, have got one thing or another in them. Um, <clears throat> we heard last year at the seminar that uh, there's a lot of uh, phenotypic and genotypic variation within common juniper. Sometimes it's a scruffy little prostrate, prostrate thing. Sometimes it's a sort of a relatively upright subtree. Uh, it's, it's quite... It, it, one juniper bush doesn't look the same as another, although they all got this common characteristic about them. Um, but if you've got garden escapes and, you, and the, the garden plants have uncertain parentage, the garden escapes are certainly going to have uncertain parentage, and you're picking berries off these things, do you know what you're getting? For a forager's point of view, it's tricky. As I said, I picked these three, and um, they were all within two minutes' walk of each other, and I was walking quite slowly. I actually had an idea to make a gin with a presentation, with a kind of a, a terroir which came right from the coast, um, hard on the coast, and in fact I've done that. Um, nobody can tell the difference? Well, I'm not surprised. I certainly can't. That's the, that's the answer for those who are interested. Um, here's my last example. Lithium verum, I'm sure we all know that, makes lovely, a lovely addition to a gin, adds finesse. Star anise, which is a Chinese species. There's also Elysium anisatum, many of you probably know this, which is Japanese star anise. And <coughs> Japanese star anise, and Japanese star anise is a, an effective uh, fish poison. Uh, it also kills humans, and it's used, in fact, as an incense in Japan. Now, there's no particular reason why these two should get confused, but unfortunately, once these things are packed into boxes and sent around the world, and they've gone through customs, and they've been checked, and they've lost their labels, and one thing and another, you can't easily tell what's what. These two, you can sort of tell the difference between these two, but the truth is, apparently, according, according 
to those you know, there is, they are not physically distinguishable. You need a gas, gas chromatograph to tell the difference between these. So once they're packed up, they're not easy to tell apart. They do actually smell different, but once they're in a box or a bag, you're not to know that until it's opened. So, and yes, there are regular human poisonings around the world from Japanese star anise. So how do we tell? What can we do? This is kind of a question I put out there. Do we trust the trader's integrity if you're buying commercial stock? Do we trust their honesty, their knowledge and expertise, or do we, use, do we have recourse to a grass chromatograph column? Um, I don't know. Uh, what, what do you guys do? This is a, a question going out here, perhaps for Elevenses. Um, what I would say is whatever you do is going to involve expertise and knowledge, and whilst that may not be a very popular thing to say, it's a very popular way of staying alive. Um, at Elevenses, I do actually have these various gins that I created. They're quite interesting, but you're not allowed to drink them because they are, because they are poisonous. Okay? But you can have a sniff and see if you can tell the difference between Sabin Juniper Gin and, um, <coughs> and Common Juniper Gin. Um, I'll see you at 11 if you're interested. Many thanks. Have a good day.